test, test, test. So everybody, please take a seat and then we can start. Can the Zoom people also hear us? You can also... Yes. Yes. They can hear us. Perfect. Very good. Thank you very much. We can also hear you, by the way. Perfect. Very good. So, uh, welcome to the fifth edition of Future IoT. Um, if I would tell you what went wrong in the um, even on-site organization when we were here, you would be uh, not believing it. So we are working for uh, four days now here uh, doing the setup uh, with lots of time for preparation before and uh, one computer died, my computer died different setup steps. We set up the stuff four times. We have a very, very um, sophisticated setup because we do live streaming over LinkedIn and YouTube. We have a Zoom where the participants can interact with us here. Um, we also record and so on. So uh, yeah, whenever something doesn't go right, it's uh, also because of the complexity and uh, yeah. So. We are very, very happy to welcome you here on site, especially also because it's the, uh, it's the second event after, after the COVID impact. We had to go online and it's a little bit more relaxed. Um, so in here, at least on the stage, we'll take off the masks. Um, besides that, um, feel free to keep the masks on. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, let's start with the trailer that you might have uh, watched already. And uh, as you see already, uh, we also have the online presence and uh, the more you uh, communicate over the event, the more people will uh, join the streams, etc. So uh, really feel free to do so. And uh, yeah, as you see, we're in Berlin in the Einstein Center. We're very thankful that we can be here. And uh, Jochen Schiller will also give some opening words. But before that, um, let me do the brief hello by the two co-organizing professors. So my name is Marc Oliver Pahl. I'm a professor for cybersecurity at uh, IMT Atlantique, Institut Min Telecom in France. And uh, yeah, I have a, a team about uh, 10 PhD students and uh, five postdocs, and we're doing uh, research in uh, all areas of cybersecurity in my keynote. I will briefly say something into uh, that direction. And uh, it's today already the fifth edition. Later on, I have a few words also to the previous editions. Um, and every, every edition is different. In every edition, we add more technology. So, uh, yeah. The second um, co-organizer, Sebastian Steinhorst. Uh, Sebastian, luckily for us, uh, luckily for him, he's on holidays, and uh, therefore he uh, left me a very nice uh, video um, where he also uh, says hello to us. Sebastian is professor for Internet of Things um, in Munich at the Technical University of Munich. Um, I think it's called Embedded Internet of Things Systems or something like that. His chair, I don't have it in mind. And I'm working with him for quite a while. This is the youngest participant, my daughter, Leah. She has uh, six months, and is also with us. And so let's, uh, let's hear what Sebastian has to say. 
A warm welcome also from my side. I'm Sebastian Steinhorst, Professor of Embedded Systems and Internet of Things at Technical University of Munich. In the next five days, you have an amazing program ahead of you. There will be keynotes by international experts, visits, hands-on activities and challenges, and plenty of social activity. And I'm sure these will be five days you will never forget. So enjoy the event and have fun. And uh, Sebastian, I'm also very impressed always with his setup because uh, throughout the pandemic he really set up a very nice uh, studio at home and uh, he perfectly gave you the spirit for the week. So it's really a week full of interesting keynotes. We have highlights from different areas. I'll, I'll make a visit to the program in uh, some minutes. And uh, so really try to profit from it the most. Use it also for networking, exchange with the other participants. You will have lots of opportunities to do so, exchange with the professors, with the experts. And uh, yeah, just, uh, just enjoy. So um, the Future IoT series, just briefly something about it. Um, it's happening to the, for the fifth time, so it started in uh, 2018, where I uh, co-organized it together with Nicolas Montavant, who's also a professor at uh, IMT Atlantique like uh, Laurent Toutain, who is with us, who will also give a keynote. He's also always involved in each of the series. And uh, back then it was in Saint-Malo, and it's a German-French series, and therefore we always switch between the countries. And this year we're in the German capital, and next year we'll uh, most likely be in the French capital, we'll be in Paris uh, for the next edition. And uh, these were the past editions, and the motto is always IoT meets something. And uh, we always try to cover a hot topic. And uh, we started with industry, so industrial internet of things. Then we went to AI, so back in 2019 there was this big AI hype, so now it matured a little bit. But AI is also highly, really highly related to our topic today, of course. I will come to that in my keynote. Um, then we had security in 2020, and then we had cyber and security in 2021. So there the focus was on softwareization, so that we have software that is driving everything. And this year we have IoT meets autonomy. The PhD school is always about around the people uh, that are participating, therefore some impressions. So this was in uh, 2018. Um, whenever one of you is interested in coming, um, feel free to do so. So this is uh, 45, 60 minutes from our place in Rennes. It's, um, it's uh, the Mont Saint-Michel um, in Normandy, and uh, Rennes is in Brittany, and it's very nice there, and uh, we had a very nice uh, group. This was a 2019 event which happened in Munich, and uh, then, we had the uh, 2020 event, which was happening fully online. Um, so this was in Zoom. It also worked very well. Um, and was as much as effort as an on-site event, because we had to get ready with that uh, Zoom stuff. Uh, that was the 2021 edition, which we did in Ren. And today, we are here for the 2022 edition, IoT meets autonomy. If you look at the logos from the previous series, the robot is a recurring element that you always find. IoT communication, IoT devices, a use case with a robot arm and automation. The five stars are like in the bonus uh, in, the, in the soccer. Um, like in a, it's like the fifth edition, so in every logo you will find a star more. The uh, automated uh, conveyor belt here is for the automation, so this is uh, some background about the logo that we created, um, my wife and I. Okay, so the organizers, I said already, so it's uh, Sebastian and I are the uh, scientific organizers for this event, and uh, besides that, there's a ton of people that are joining the organization. So my wife and daughter actively and passively um, because I spend a lot of time working on that and but they are also involved because uh, my wife is working for the German French Academy for the industry of the future and uh, they are her role is also the education and therefore she's also very much involved. Then we have uh, Fabian Rhein from Siemens who's in the back. Uh, we have uh, Tim and uh, Samira from the Einstein Center that are here that were huge help for organizing it because when you do such an event and you're not on site, you really, really rely heavily on the people organizing it on site. And uh, it was 
really a great pleasure because they do the huge work. They have this very nice space. So uh, your people are doing a very good job. So you can be very proud of them. Um, then, of course, we have Lars here who uh, really worked endlessly. He was here with me until 4 a.m. this morning and came back even at 7 a.m. So he almost did not sleep. Uh, this is the energy he put in. Erkin, who was also with us, he had to leave a little earlier yesterday because we had dinner and he felt medium okay afterwards. Um, then we had from the international Katharina, the two Katharinas uh, from our side, uh, Sandrine, Fabienne, that you know from the uh, entrance already, Friedrich from the building here, Antonio from Tom International, Paul Guillaume Meunier and Cosima Stocker from the German French Academy for the Industry of the Future. And I'm sure I forgot more people and I want to especially thank those that I forgot. Okay, good. And so without these people it would be totally impossible and uh, so I will thank them also at the end, but it's important that you know the people that are here who is behind uh, the event. Okay, so the concept um, contains multiple elements, so uh, meets industry, so we have strong industry partners, participation always uh, with uh, five plus industry partners each time, this is also important. Um, then PhD exchange, also a very important part, today you will have the possibility to present your PhD thesis to exchange with the others. Keynotes, we have nine keynotes. Hands-on, we have five challenges, I guess. So this will be also a big part with uh, two um, hack nights and a presentation on Friday, more on that later. Um, of course, we also have a cultural program, so you will get to know Berlin, you will get to know the environment here. This is also very important. You will get to know the um, food culture also because we'll eat every day. And at least uh, today and on Wednesday, we'll have some um, typical Berlin food. And on the other days, we'll, we'll order something. Um, yeah, so these, these are some of the important things. Because a PhD school is different from a lecture or something like that. It's really like being together for a week, working together, spending time together with the other people. And therefore, the whole program is very important. And part of that is also the decoration of the room, for instance, where we spend like, quite a while on it and so on. Here you see the Twitter wall, for instance, so if you're Twittering, uh, it will appear there. Okay. Then, of course, we have also our sponsors. So we have the uh, schools, so Institut Min Telecom, EMT Atlantique, which is one school within that. Uh, we have my chair, we have the Technical University of Munich, um, with my group that is uh, still partly there, and also with uh, the group of Sebastian, of course, TUM International, TU Berlin, the Einstein Center, of course, German French Academy for the Industry of the Future and the University Franco Almond, Deutsch Französische Hochschule, um, which are the main sponsors of the event. So they made it possible that we could have the registration fees as low as they are due to their generous uh, support. Um, the foundation of the Institute Min Telecom, uh, the Brittany Region, and then our industry partners Siemens, AWS, Aclio, Airbus, and uh, Parion Analytics and also the Institut Canot, the Paul Dexanos Cyber, German chapter of the ACM, and the IRISA that also um, sponsor the event. So thank you very much for the support because without the partners, we wouldn't have the program because we wouldn't have the speakers, and we wouldn't also have the funding um, to run the event in the quality uh, that we try to reach. As said, um, we have different social media, Basically, it's always um, the future IoT here in the end of the major platforms. We have our blog, so for each talk you find a blog entry, feel free to share it. Uh, we have the website, of course, and we have the hashtag fired. We found out that um, this is also used throughout the Twitter a lot, and therefore we also have the second hashtag, which is fired5 for the fifth edition. And uh, so, yeah, you can, uh, you can use the two. Okay. A quick overview over the program. I just look at the clock because Jochen has to leave uh, very soon. Um, so let me just briefly go through today and for the other days I will present to you every morning anyways. So next thing we'll have is uh, we'll have the uh, greetings um, by Professor Dr. Jochen Schiller who is the Vorstand of the Einstein Center for Digital Future. Um, then afterwards we have Dr. Majori Bertomier from the Deutsch Französische Hochschule, University Franco Almond, who is the General Secretary General. 
Um, afterwards, we'll have uh, some uh, greetings from uh, Paul Guillaume Meunier and Cosima Stocker for the German French Academy for the Industry of the Future. And then we'll have some uh, greetings by Hans Oliver Wilhelm, who is the uh, um, president of the German chapter of the ACM. So he's the president, I'm the vice president of that chapter, um, which is the uh, German dependent, dependence uh, from the ACM, the biggest. Uh, computer society in the world, um, which exists together with the um, GI, Gesellschaft für Informatik, which in Germany is much bigger. The differentiation to us is that we are a little bit closer to industry, so we try really to bring industry and academia together. And the GI might sometimes be a little bit more academic, so this is a little bit for the German landscape of these societies. Then I will do the opening keynote, uh, which is good, because if the start now takes a little bit longer, I can accommodate for that. At 10.30, then, you have uh, the PhD poster presentation, where those of you who send a poster, I can hang them already in the background, um, can uh, present. I have three minutes for pitching them here, which is important, because there you have the attention of everybody, and therefore it's a big opportunity to do so. Um, then we go for lunch at 11.30, which is just nearby, so we'll leave the building, but it's uh, only 100 meters away. Um, then we present the challenges, um, possibly some updates, but uh, Fabian and uh, Lars will tell you a little bit more about that, because they're adding this activity. And then in the afternoon, we have a keynote by Falco, who I also know uh, quite well. Um, and then we'll visit the microfactory and we do a city tour and tonight uh, we invite you for a joint dinner. The upcoming days, I mean, you know the program, I will just quickly go over it. So we start at 8.45 each day. I'll do a recap of the previous day. I will tell a little bit more in detail what we did, um, what we'll do over the day. Tomorrow we have the hack night in the evening. Um, on Wednesday, we go for a joint dinner again and do a quick uh, city tour. And uh, typically, we have two keynotes per day, and in between, you have lots of time for working on the challenges. Precisely, you have 18 and a half hours, which sounds a lot, but in the end, you will see that it's not, uh, it's not enough time for all your cool ideas, probably. Uh, this is also why we asked you to start a little bit early. Um, Thursday, we have another hack night besides that regular program. And uh, Friday, we have the presentations of your challenges. Um, we'll have some winners. We have very nice trophies for the winning team. Um, but more about that uh, later. Okay, and uh, that brings me to the greetings. And uh, I uh, thought it's a good idea to give the honor to start with the greetings to the house here. And uh, therefore, I hand over to Jochen Schiller. And uh, he's a professor. So what, what is your chair? Well, well, computer systems. It's very general. Computer <laughs> systems. So you can ask him everything. Yeah. He'll, have the, he'll have the answer. <laughs> and I know Jochen because he, he wrote a book on mobile communications. And back in the years when I was studying myself, he had me understanding all these tons of acronyms of mobile communication. I was always very impressed uh, with that. And therefore, I'm even more happy to hand over to Jochen, and you can give him a warm applause. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mark Oliver. So now I guess I'm a bit, not only a bit jealous, because I mean, you can do really fancy things now this week, and I have to torture students and do some administrative stuff. So a warm welcome from my side. I'm a member of the executive board of the Einstein Center Digital Future. So what is this all about? So the ECDF, as we call it, uh, acronyms again, uh, here located in the so-called Robert Koch Forum, Side note, Robert Koch discovered the tuberculosis bacterium many years ago in this building. So we have the old lecture halls. OK, thanks. Uh, and what we do here is basically looking into the future or the futures of digitalization. So what does it mean? You do many, many, many fancy things. I'm also a techie myself doing systems and IoT, and we do remote attestation of these fancy things and looking into kernels and looking into all the technical details. But in the end, on the other side of the street, you see the buildings of the members of the parliament. They will decide what's written in laws. They will decide uh, what really is allowed to do or not. There's also industry, but there's society. And one part of the work we are doing here with 30 plus brand new students, uh, professors sponsored by industry is looking into exactly these details. Will society accept this technology? How does the technology influence society? What about the economic 
and ecological footprint of all these things. I mean, you do fancy things, but what does this mean? How many new nuclear power plants do we need for IoT? Does this make sense, or is this a completely stupid idea? So there are many more ways to do research than just looking to technology. It's very, very important, it's very interesting, but there are so many more things from art, so we have something like, Emmanuel somewhere, Emmanuel is up there, so they did something like a suit for conductors for an orchestra, so IoT for conductor suit. Fancy things, but maybe there's an outcome. Yes, there's an outcome. We have the Charité, one of the largest university hospitals here, and you can reuse the sensors there for the patients, for doing some fancy things. So this is exactly what we try to explore here, so sponsored by industry, many new professors, and then there we have something like 60, 70 PIs, those are the old professors, gray hair, whatever, and looking after many things here, and that's the idea. So this is something like an incubator of crazy ideas. We also have labs, you will visit one of them, microfactory, but uh, also a safety and security lab where we show the politicians what does it mean if you have shitty IoT things in critical infrastructures? What happens? What may happen if someone shuts down the electric power grid, which is not that complicated? So uh, we don't need a war for this. This is very simple. And these are the things we have to show and explain the politicians because they studied law or whatever, and they have no idea about technology. So that's basically a part of the job we do here. And we are really, really happy to have you here. And as I said in the beginning, I'm very jealous. I also want to do some more hacking and all these things. but. <clears throat> As you grow older, you don't have the time for this. So I wish you all the best for these days. I mean, really use it, discuss, do a lot, ask all those guys and ask them to ask them and use the time. And I wish you a wonderful week here in Berlin. It's not that hot anymore, which is quite good. You can do some sightseeing and maybe you can stay here a little bit longer. So enjoy the time. Thanks for having you here. Thank you very much for these uh, wonderful words that are really, again, uh, setting the spirit, and this is uh, very important at that beginning. Perfect. Thank you very much, Johan. So, our uh, second greetings would are by Dr. Marjorie Bartomier from the Deutsche Französische Hochschule University, Franco Almont. And uh, she joins us online. Ah, we can see you. Perfect. So it's a great pleasure having you. And also, uh, probably you know it, um, the DFH is uh, co-sponsoring the event now also for the fifth time. And without you, it would be impossible to run that. And uh, I especially also want to thank you for the existence of it, but also for your great stuff, because it's always a super great pleasure to exchange um, with them. So, um, yeah, Madame Leprovost and Madame Traum, especially because I'm, I'm often exchanging with them. So, yeah, thank you very much. So, please also give a very warm applause to Marjorie. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you hear me. You can hear me. And I hope I am yes. coming from, already coming from my holidays too. So, I hope I didn't forget my English too too much um, um yes i just wanted to to give you a few words to warmly welcome you to this uh, phd franco german international <laughs> uh, program um and summer school um and um yes to to give you a few words about the franco german university um which is a network of uh uh, about um, 200 uh, universities in France and Germany and all the world and uh, uh, with uh, about 6,400 students and uh, 300 PhD doctorates um, and um, 23,000 uh, alumni, so <laughs> networking is, is, uh, is, is uh, more than a word by us. Um, maybe I could uh, say uh, why we were, as you say, Mark Oliver, um, as you were saying, why we were supporting um, this project, your project and the summer schools um, uh, for the fifth <laughs> time, um, because I think um, 
um, for sure, uh, Internet of Things um, is a very interesting and creative and innovative and social and economic and scientifically <laughs> relevant uh, uh, subject. Um, because, of course, um, this concept brings challenges and opportunities, risks and threats and uh, um, possibility, uh, great possibility and, <laughs> and, um, and, and risks and, and difficulties. Um, but we found it very interesting the way you are uh, going to work with the subject on the topic um, because a wide spectrum of issues has been and will be uh, highlighted um, through the uh, different um, PhD summer schools that you made and that you and, and for this year too. And um, uh, we find it um, particularly interesting that um, the, the way that you are studying um, the, this topic in relation with the um, enterprises, the firms, the economics, and the politics uh, under the prism of uh, engineering, but also in its legal, social, or ethical aspects, um, seems to us to be very, very uh, important. Uh, for the future of the Internet of Things and probably for the future of our world and, and planet. No? Um, but for sure, we already we we also supported uh, it because of the quality of the actors and of the participants, and that's a, <laughs> that's a way to say uh, hello. You're the best, <laughs> and uh, uh, to the students um, and the doctorates uh, who are there, uh, remotely and uh, physically present. Um, um, of course, the relevance of the subjects uh, submitted for examination was in our program of uh, scientific uh, events, uh, what, what we are uh, funding um, since uh, more than 10 or past 20 years. Um, and we are convinced that the Franco-German cooperation and the European and international cooperation make these additions particularly uh, rich. It links the academic world with the industrial one, and it's therefore one of the main events of the Franco-German Academy uh, of the, for the industry of the future, uh, which we were supporting too. And uh, we are um, very glad uh, about the cooperation that we have. And we found it uh, very interesting that the collaboration with leading industrial partners in France and Germany um, attest to the excellency of uh, the projects. And um, yeah, we are, have uh, not only full confidence, but a great experience in the, in the, in the cooperation with the, um, with the IEMT Atlantique and with the Technical University of Munich. Um, we are not spe specialists in digitization. Uh, but we have a special interest in this field. Um, the Franco-German University organized the Franco-German experts um, with uh, the help uh, of the Institut Mini Telecom, um, um, a meeting where three topics of debate were highlighted, the industry of the future, the artificial intelligence and uh, ethics and the digital technology in higher education. And um, this last theme is uh, fully reflected in the future uh, of Internet of uh, Things, since behind these terms lies the didactic concept of connecting industry and academia through keynotes or practical sessions. 
Um, okay. Uh, in addition to this experts meeting, uh, which has taken place in uh, 2019, uh, we are uh, also been conducting uh, various projects. At the same time, we were supporting uh, projects with the industry, uh, with the Institut Français Deutschland um, about um, digital utopia, also digital utopia, and um, I think. Uh, we 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 were and we will be um, interesting in um, uh, funding and supporting the development of uh, uh, transdisciplinary corporations and uh, of course uh, feel free to <laughs> apply for uh, more and more. Um, uh, scientific events and uh, uh, as um, PhD students, you can apply uh, for uh, such events too. And for us, it's uh, uh, since the quality is given and the cooperation is given, uh, um, it uh, will be uh, examined with um, um, a very, very um, <laughs> good eye, I would say. Um, of course, we would be happy if as a result of your encounters, uh, corporations uh, continues to grow. Uh, we had a call for projects dedicated for the team for the, the issue of digitalization. And a call for project dedicated to the theme of um, artificial intelligence, uh, e and uh, it takes it stakes in Europe. And uh, we recently uh, supported uh, the um, Franco-German uh, Commerce and Industry Chamber, um, and with the help of uh, Paul Guillem uh, in the framework of the VivaTech uh, trade show and our. Franco-German uh, tech lab, bringing together nearly 100 startup and uh, innovations presented by 12 academic, economic, and regional partners in order to encourage European digital, digital so sovereignty. So feel free, feel free to, to think, to, 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 to use the human intelligence that you, that you have. And um, um, thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, of the event. Um, I wish you all uh, exciting and fruitful discussions and uh, great success by the challenges and the hackathons. Thank you very much and enjoy and just have fun. <laughs> thank you very much, Marjorie. And let me quickly show you also the audience so that you see to whom you are talking. So maybe now you see it. And uh, yeah, th thanks a lot for, for you greetings as well. And as Marjorie said, um, we always have German French participants because we especially advertise the event in the two countries and uh, the event series and also the German French Academy for the Industry of the Future is really a motor of pushing especially research in the two countries and the German at uh, the Deutsche Französische Hochschule University Franco Almond they have great programs also if you want to do exchange programs as PhD students and so on so it's always worth looking at the website uh, which options and opportunities they have they also sponsor great events like this one so uh, great thanks uh, thanks a lot again okay so then let me switch back to me uh, here, perfect, good. So um, the next ones to deliver some greetings are Paul Guillem and uh, Cosima and uh, Olivia, yeah. So, uh, oh, I always forget to put her. She will uh, not like that. <laughs> and Leah, so I can take over Leah. And uh, Cosima and Olivia, Ah, Olivia even has the, the shirt of the German French Academy. Um, we'll tell you some more um, about the German French Academy for the industry of the future and um, give some greetings. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark Oliver. My name is Cosima Stocker. I'm the project manager of the German French Academy for the industry of the future at the TU Munich. So at the Technical University of Munich, I'm very happy to welcome you all here 
for us is a great, a great pleasure because um, this summer school is one of, one of our dearest and one of our most yeah, exciting, I think. So thank you at all the organizers to support this. So our task, our challenge, our objective is to foster German-French cooperation, as Mark Oliver already said. So that is why we are strongly supporting formats like that. And we're always looking for new French-German projects. So if you have any ideas, just feel free to ask me any time. I will be here in the next days. And my colleague from IMT in France, Pagier Meunier, is about to arrive in uh, about an hour. And I will also give a quick word to Olivia, who is co coordinating our education projects. Very important. Hello, everyone. Um, I uh, was already in contact with some of you uh, through emails and everything, and I uh, wish you a great time at the summer school. You are our future, the young people, and um, I hope uh, we can um, give you something back and have a nice time here in Berlin. And greetings also from Leah, our youngest person here. <laughs> okay, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm the uh, German-French Academy for the Industry of the Future. Also like the DFH, U of A um, is a strong motor of the collaboration. Uh, so this uh, academy was founded by uh, Tum and IMT back in uh, 2015 already. <clears throat> I'm also in an active role in this uh, German-French Academy. And uh, we have uh, lots of uh, very interesting German-French projects and uh, the academy is also providing co-funding for those. Um, we also have a strong teaching portfolio. Uh, for instance, on our website, you can find a full list of the MOOCs available at TUM and IMT, um, which is already a quite interesting resource. Uh, so uh, yeah, make sure to check out uh, the website of this institution as well. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, my dear, uh, Vorstandskollege, our Vorstandsvorsitzender and our President Ernst Oliver Wilhelm from the German chapter of the ACM. Ernst Oliver, you probably heard it already, I said some words about the German chapter of the ACM, but you can always do it much better and more shiny than me. So uh, therefore I hand over to you and I'm very happy to, to hear your greetings and a warm welcome for Ernst Oliver. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mark Oliver, and uh, thank you very much uh, the future of, uh, let's say, IoT to welcome me here uh, as a short speaker. Of course, I totally acknowledge what, uh, let's say, the speakers before me have already said. You guys, you are really the future. So the current generation, like me, of course, we have borrowed the world from you. So, so you are really very important, let's say, to, to shape the future, not only of IoT, but of the digital transformation um, in principle, yeah, and um, I'm very happy um, that um, um, that such a kind of event like Mark Oliver has organized with his uh, friends and and partners exists actually, yeah, because this is really a, a fantastic platform to to network, to share new ideas, also really to 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 uh, to give you the opportunity to bring in new new ideas. You know, this is very important because the future is of course dynamic. So it's not only the repetition of what is already known. No, it's something, let's say something dynamic. You, you can create something new, a new approach, new thinking, new ideas. This is what we need here. And of course, this platform for Mark Oliver is such a kind of uh, opportunity here. Yeah, And so that's the reason why the German chapter of the ACM strongly supports uh, a future IoT PhD school, not only this year, but also the years before. And I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, the German chapter. So what, what is the German chapter of the ACM? So this is, we are a nonprofit organization which wants to shape a livable and sustainable world of the future with the help of computer science, because actually we are, a, let's say, the German representation of the world largest Association uh, for Computing Professionals. This is the a uh, Association for Computing Machinery. So annually, we are giving out also the Turing Award, which is would be called maybe the Nobel Prize of uh, Computer Science. And 
let's say in Germany, we are giving a strong focus on, on strengthening the dialogue between academic research and practical applications of computer science. Well, already uh, Mark Oliver has emphasized in his initial uh, welcome address. Uh, furthermore, we in Germany um, would like to, to encourage unconventional ideas and projects, leaving the comfort zone. And for that, of course, we want to create within our um, organization uh, opportunities to participate on all levels, not only, let's say, on operational level or administrative level, but really also you can easily lead, let's say, efforts, or you can even apply to be a member of the executive board, if you like. So the age doesn't matter. So if you are passionate about computing technology and you want to make a difference, please join us. And uh, of course, this is really um, now the address to you. We want young people, let's say, to take responsibility for our digital future. And of course, I don't have too much time now to, let's say, to bring on my own ideas, but maybe here's some food for thought for you, maybe. Is there a blueprint for a sustainable IoT? I think there is, yeah, the Internet of Trees. And I have just watched just recently a documentary in Netflix about a German guy who made some research on trees. And he found actually that they have a high level autonomy, but at the same time, they have a very strong connection with each other, but not only among trees, but also with other species like mushrooms. And it's really so fascinating uh, to see this documentary or to read this book from Peter Wollim. So maybe this can be a source of inspiration for you, let's say to develop some new approaches for the, uh, let's say technical uh, IoT. Yeah, and with this, I would like to leave you um, and uh, would like to wish you uh, exciting and joyful days uh, together, yeah? And um, to engage, uh, not only in, uh, let's say, let's say in the specific hackathons and so on, but also to engage in the larger discussion about our digital future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans Oliver. And uh, as Oliver was already saying, it engage. And uh, as participants of this event, uh, you will have the opportunity to also join the German chapter of the ACM. Um, even with a uh, strong discount and uh, it's a very um, nice organization where you can get into contact uh, with uh, lots of people that are also engaged working in uh, computer science. Um, so if you're interested in that, do not hesitate to contact Ernst Oliver or me and uh, we I will be very happy to tell you more about that. So yeah, thank you very much Ernst Oliver. I think you were even on holidays, so thank you very much for interrupting them uh, for us. And. Uh, yeah, that uh, closes the greeting session for today. So probably on the next days, we'll have some uh, more people just saying a few words in the morning. So Paul Guillem might say something tomorrow. Maybe we'll have someone from the French embassy, which is actually on the other side of the road. Let's just show to the Zoom participants again uh, whom we have here and what they are unluckily missing because they cannot be on site. And you also see what I see. It's also interesting for you maybe. Okay, good. So as I said at the beginning, I do always the opening keynote for various reasons. Um, and one of the reasons is uh, that if I do the opening keynote, if the opening takes longer, I can uh, speak a little bit shorter um, to uh, make it sure uh, that we stay in time. So that means we have about uh, 35 minutes uh, for that. And afterwards uh, is good because there we have the PhD poster presentation. I put that in the morning so that you know each other already before lunch, you know what the people are doing. Plus, I also put it there because it's an activity where those of you who present have to stand up and that means we also have a physical activity because as you will notice, um, the week is also quite intense because we'll be working from the morning until the night and uh, you'll be probably passionate about what you do and uh, therefore it's also important to do these changes in the program and we try to, uh, to take care of that also a little bit. Okay, um, good. 
So, uh, yeah, for each of the um, keynotes, I produced a trailer. Maybe some of you saw them already on YouTube. Saying that, I realized that I produced all the remaining trailers yesterday, but I did not upload all of them. So for today, they're all uploaded. The other ones I will upload um, once I find a minute. And uh, the trailer is also good to, for sharing, for attracting people, of course. And uh, I will always show the trailer before the keynote, and therefore we we'll, uh, can start uh, with my trailer now. Our world is driven by autonomous algorithms. They are surrounding us, we don't even notice it, and they are providing the functionality often, at least partially autonomous. In my talk, IoT Mates Autonomy, I will give you some of the important background things you have to know as computer scientist and user of this technology in order to survive in today's and tomorrow's world. Okay, and uh, as I just said, I want to do exactly this, so setting the frame a bit and giving you some context, um, because with the other keynotes, we'll, uh, as you've seen, because you've looked at the program, with the other keynotes, we'll deep dive into certain aspects. The greetings actually were totally great, because uh, the people were already covering uh, quite a spectrum with what they said, and uh, IoT is almost everywhere, and uh, yeah. Okay. The title traditionally is the same as in uh, the event, so it's Internet of Things meets Autonomy. But what does that mean? So what is Internet of Things, what is Autonomy? Well, um, first thing, Internet, and uh, for the Internet, um, you all know probably what the Internet is, but uh, who would feel ready to give a definition of what the Internet is? Anyone uh, wants to uh, say something? So if I would ask you, what is the internet, what would you say? Yeah, you, you will say something very good. Yeah, just a word, oh, I yeah, said the network. I, I said the network. Okay, perfect, very good. As well as a technical aspect, do we have other things that you would say? If, because I mean, we're all working with the internet, obviously. But what is always tricky, I mean, you know it because you're also scientists, is really defining it. And uh, maybe other, some other key words, what would you say? So after the PhD presentations, you will be more interactive and really try to be so, because a PhD school, as I said, is, is not a lecture. So I mean, even though we are standing here and delivering, the idea is really for exchanging, and therefore, don't be shy, exchange. Um, we were already very happy about the WhatsApp group, that there was lots of activity ongoing, and uh, so we'll also use the opportunity here uh, on site. So what is the internet? Um, who could say it better than uh, one of the fathers of the internet, uh, Vince Cerf, um, uh, who uh, together with Robert Kahn uh, developed the uh, TCP IP uh, protocol uh, components, so one of the key figures among many others, as he always says, because he's uh, very modest, and uh, I have the opportunity to uh, know him. And uh, I did an interview with him back in 2016 already. And uh, let's just hear a little a few minutes into it on my YouTube channel. You find the full interview. It's 20 minutes. It's worth listening because uh, the most surprising to me was hearing um, how many applications they already anticipated when they created it, like video telephony, for instance. So let's have a quick hearing in, but we won't have time to hear the entire thing, obviously. And as I have the starting thing there, so there's also the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, where I'm also not involved in the organization, but linked through the German chapter of the ACM, and I also know, know the organizers a bit. This is also something, if you never heard of it, uh, look for it, Heidelberg Laureate Forum, also a really great and luxury event. Yeah, nice having you here. It's a One pleasure. Of the fathers of the internet. One of them, anyway. Remember, there's a lot of them. That's right. But you're one of them. Very good. So, when, what would you say to students? So, why is it 
important to study and explore the core technologies that drive today's internet? So there are several reasons. The first one is that the internet is everywhere, and if you have anything to do with uh, any kind of engineering that involves the use of the net, you should understand how it works and what, you know, what its weaknesses and what its strengths are. Uh, but looking at it as a purely engineering design, it's worth looking at because it has scaled by a factor of a million over the course of its uh, existence. And it's not often you find designs that have the ability to scale that much. And so looking at the layered structure and the functionality of the layers and the, uh, the interfaces between them uh, and the stability of those interfaces is actually an important lesson to learn. There's a price to pay for, for the layering, but uh, it has allowed for a substantial amount of expansion in the technologies of the networks underneath and the applications that go on top. And so there are lessons to be learned from understanding the design and the implementation. And so I would encourage students to look at it from both ways because they're going to live in a world which is filled with internet until something else comes along. And so what, what, what would you say? Is it, is it more the abstraction or the simplification of it? Okay, so uh, you can turn the volume a little bit down again, Lars, so that they are not all overwhelmed, thanks. Um, I, I leave it just running in the background right now. So. We heard already it's a network, and uh, what is interesting also for those of you who did internet, <coughs> who do <coughs> internet research, you also know that they're even called like that, autonomous systems within. And uh, so the internet is um, probably the biggest autonomous and the, maybe also one of the longest existing autonomous uh, computer systems that we have um, on, uh, in our existence at least. And um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is quite interesting. And it's the backbone of all the applications uh, that we, or most of the applications that we have today. Um, bringing lots of opportunities. When you think back in the last 10 years, we had something like cloud computing, we had edge computing. All this requires interconnectivity between the machines because you want to offload um, processing from a local site to a remote site, and therefore you need a network. The systems are distributed, they're interconnected, they have uh, low latencies, as uh, Vince just said, they scale, and so on. And uh, therefore it's, it's very interesting to, to think about that, because it's not like a granted infrastructure that was already there. It's something that has grown, that is continuously growing, and uh, this is uh, this very, uh, Amazing to me always, and uh, yeah. So, so this is this is the internet. And then the next thing is of things. So, what are things? Well, um, a thing, especially in the terminology of the Internet of Things, a thing for me, often or typically, is a cyber physical system. In the true word sense, cyber being software and physical being the physical world. And so a cyber physical system is a software, so if I would be the software now, and I would be a cyber physical system, through the physical component, I can reach into the physicality, and I can do something with the physical environment. Background of that is pervasive computing, or one of the backgrounds, and in pervasive computing you have a computer, uh, then you add networking support. Then you have a distributed system because you can connect compute nodes that are distributed. Then you add mobility support. Then you have a mobile system because you can move it. Your smartphone is a mobile system, something that also only arrived in uh, 2008, so it's a young technology. Um, and then we add pervasiveness support. So this thing, we can touch something. And so then we have something that was called smart device, it could still be called like that, but it's also a cyber physical system. Or it could also be called a pervasive system, but this is more from the pervasive or ubiquitous computing community, this term. And uh, then you have software, and uh, then you can, uh, you can program that. And this is from a, from a lecture I was uh, giving at Technical University of Munich. And it had the two parts uh, that are covering this, um, because this is, uh, this is very interesting. Okay, and um, 
take home for you is, even though you think, okay, Internet of Things is totally clear, um, there's more behind that is worth thinking of um, because it's, it's, it's very interesting, the technology. Okay, so um, the third part, um, uh, probably the slide comes afterwards, I mixed them up. So the third part is autonomy, it meets autonomy. And uh, so the question is now, what is autonomy? We heard it a little bit. So when you think about application scenarios, the first thing that probably comes into your mind because it's the most iconic use case for the moment is uh, self-driving cars. So they are um, considered autonomous in a certain sense. Uh, ubiquitous computing often uses autonomous functionality. Actually, most of the systems around you use autonomous functionality. Factory automation, also a topic we will cover, is also using um, autonomous functionality. Okay, there's the slide I was waiting for. And um, what, what is now autonomous? So for giving you a background on that as well, um, it's interesting to look at different levels of autonomy. And uh, there you see that on the left you have manual. And when you now have a uh, computer system, manual means that you have to launch the tasks and so on. The next step is managed. That means you have tools that do data analytics and so on for you, so they provide you with the data to ease your work. The next thing is you do something predictive. So the system gives you recommendations, but you are still in charge of implementing them. So it's up to you then to say, okay, uh, we will shut down this user, for instance, or something like that. But the system assists you and says, like, okay, I as a system, I think it could make sense. Here's the data behind it. Uh, please take your decision. The next one is adaptive. So there, the system is working on its own, but you give the high-level policies. So you tell the system what it should do, and then it's following the rules according to what it's able to do. And finally, autonomic is even more, so there the system is really working on its own. So you still give input, of course, because you have to tell the system where it should go, or you don't. When you think about AI systems, they might evolve by themselves and give them their goals themselves, but uh, we are not there in the larger sense yet. Um, and it's interesting, why, why did I want to show you this? Um, it's interesting to realize that there are different levels of autonomy and they can be specified in various ways, so this is just one way of it. But it's interesting to see when we talk of, about autonomy, um, what is within these as aspects. And this is, uh, this is the goal of, the, of this uh, slide for me. Um, when I was telling you we are not there yet with the full autonomic, uh, autonomous uh, systems, um, in, in the internet, for instance, so there you, you say uh, to the BGP protocol, okay, this is what you want to happen, and then it's configuring itself and autonomously managing with all the problems and troubles it has. In cybersecurity, you can, for instance, when you want to, which is my domain at the moment, so when you want to do something against uh, maybe the strongest attack at the moment, which is, um, a ransomware so that you have something, you get infected, it spreads automatically locally and tries to encrypt and shut down the systems. There, if you don't have autonomous functionality, you're not fast enough because there you really have to disconnect parts of the network fast and therefore in the small, um, we have systems that have autonomous functionality. Um, in the big, you probably heard about the um, the Google um, artificial intelligence thing that was in the media that uh, one of the um, engineers said, okay, it developed consciousness. Um, so now we are very close to the end of the world. Um, so there's work going on. This, this would be my conclusion from that. Okay, so um, why do I want autonomy? I, I just said it a little bit. So the good thing is if we have something autonomous, it can react fast, it can adapt very well. In that context, I also have a slide on that, but let's, let me say just right here. 
The self-adoption is, of course, very important when you talk about autonomous functionality. Because autonomous functionality means that the system is able to adapt to the context. And if the context changes, the system can um, adapt to that. And artificial intelligence or better machine learning is a very good technique to analyze data in a fuzzy way and take conclusions and react to that. And therefore, artificial intelligence or machine learning is a very strong tool if we want to go towards autonomous functionality because it enables us not to have the typical rules. If A happens, then do B, in an extended form, of course, but to have something radically different in the sense that if you see a dog, um, then bark, something like that. So we have some, uh, the possibility to express on an extremely high level what we want to happen, and the system is able in a non-magical way, I mean, we can explain everything that happens there in the little steps, it's, but it's, the interesting thing is the abstraction. So we have the possibility to talk to the system in a very abstract way, and this enables the system also to adapt to new contexts, because when a new dog is coming, the system can probably detect it with the errors. So you know probably this uh, muffin thing where they have the muffin with the things that look like a face and the AI was saying, okay, this is a dog. Of course, problems, but interesting development and uh, we'll see more in that direction. Problems, uh, this is the lower part here, ethical considerations. So if a system is autonomous, it means the system takes decisions. Typical example is you have the pedestrian crossing and uh, the car will have to kill someone and there's a child and an old person and so on. And the car definitely cannot stop. And the interesting question or consideration there is the car will be able to take a decision because the car is ultra fast. So it will really be able to decide. But in the end, it's not the car that decides, but it's the engineers that created the algorithms. And this brings a lot of responsibility because imagine you are creating this algorithm. Okay, you have uh, five people and you have to kill three of them. You have a choice, what do you do? And then uh, it's interesting for you as an engineer because you really have to be aware of this re responsibility. And um, at the same time, it's also nothing where people can expect that you can alone take this responsibility. And therefore, what Marjorie said at the beginning, this interdisciplinarity is super important. And the more computer science is penetrating into our non-computer world, um, the more important it gets. Because we have interaction with people all the time. And uh, in that situation with the car, for instance, you could say, okay, let's just mimic what the human would do. Human would probably not see it, so human would just continue driving. Maybe this is an option. Then the legal thing also comes in because there was nobody driving. So who is responsible? The car manufacturer, somebody else, the one who bought the car. So very interesting and also this intersection between multiple disciplines is very obvious and very important when we talk about um, autonomy. Cybersecurity, of course, super important because we also heard that um, already from Jochen. These IoT systems and the ubiquitous computing systems, they're penetrating our world. They're everywhere. They're even in the, some of these light switches that were dumped some time ago, they're now smart. We, heard, we saw it now in the current situation with the war in Ukraine that some wind turbines were not working anymore and not because they had locally physical problems, but because the back end was not responding anymore in the way that they expected it to respond, and therefore they just stopped operation. And uh, therefore cybersecurity is ultra important because if we have a so-called critical infrastructure, so something we rely on for our living, we have to make sure that it's really um, protected. And if it's working autonomously, this is even more important because a small attack might have a huge effect because the system is autonomously doing something. And the last point that I put there, which is the obvious point, is complexity. The more things I connect and the more autonomous 
I make the functionality that I have in, um, the more complex the system is. And uh, complexity is an enemy of verifiability, validability um, of algorithms and so on. And uh, therefore we move from deterministic to non-deterministic and non-deterministic is often something that we do not necessarily want, but when it goes to autonomy, it's something uh, that we have to take into account and something that uh, we need. Okay, so how to get autonomy in software? Um, probably many of you know that already. So there was a, an article by uh, Keshav from IBM, I guess, which dates back to 2007, I guess, uh, which is about the so-called MAPE, and later MAPE K loop, uh, which is called Monitor, Analyze, Plan, and Execute. Um, and uh, this is an interesting model um, because it simply helps you to structure a bit um, what are the activities if you have autonomous functionality and uh, I show it to you on the right here. So you have a cyber physical system so it can sense and actuate, so input and output. And uh, for both activities you basically have uh, two entities that are doing something. So the monitor side is getting the data and making sense of the data. The analyze model module is doing some high level analytics. So uh, what does that actually mean? The plan is then uh, taking some actions and uh, the execute is uh, transforming these actions into actual activities that you send to the hardware that you are controlling that is then interacting with the environment. A good example is a heater because it's quite trivial. So you get a temperature, you have a target um, temperature here, and then you can either heat or not heat. Um, and in the middle you see knowledge, because as for all algorithms, the base for your activity is data. And uh, for data, you need data, and if data is um, structured and semantically annotated, uh, you would call it knowledge, and uh, therefore knowledge is important, and therefore MAPK, monitor, analyze, plan, execute, and knowledge. Okay, so about this one I was already talking. So for me, machine learning and artificial intelligence are very important tools um, when it comes to autonomous functionality. Now to the, uh, to the cybersecurity. So uh, I already said a little bit cybersecurity is super important and I want to illustrate this a little bit more. So when you think about hospitals, they were very much affected by these ransomware attacks and there were actual people dying because someone remotely ran an attack or even a semi-automated attack was running into a space. And if these systems that are connected would not be cyber physical, this would not have been possible because they would have had the computer and the problem would have stayed inside the computer. And with that, now you can really affect something. You can uh, change a pacemaker or something like that. For the hospital problems, even the inside the computer would probably have caused a huge collapse because uh, they would not have been able to manage their patients and so on. Um, but this dimension of having computers connected to us and interacting with us, I also have another video where I have a robot arm that has a chainsaw mounted uh, just for some activity. And if you're in the factory and this chainsaw is war driving and it's cutting you, maybe you know also this video of the stapler driver. Um, obviously, this is a problem. And uh, again, it's our responsibility as computer engineers to be aware of that at least and to also raise attention uh, when such things are created and also to take the responsibility to not um, create something against uh, our fellow humans and so on. Um, the second is uh, supplies of everything we need like water, energy and so on. So there you know, you know the examples. Um, I want to point your attention also on the solar winds attack where you had an entity company that was updating software in their client sites 
they were attacked and then the clients were attacked. So you have very sophisticated attacks or when you think back on the Stuxnet attack, which for me was the prototype of a very, very advanced persistent threat. There the thing was that you even had air-gapped, so physically disconnected systems that were affected by the attack. And again, my point is simply that one, if you rely on software for your living, you really have to take care of securing your software. Because if the software gets a problem, you get a problem and you really physically get a problem. And even though this dimension seems so obvious, it's often that we ignore it. And therefore, I always try to push it a bit, that you're aware of it, and uh, that you try to take uh, care of it. Um, then, of course, communication infrastructure as the backbone, CPUs, also a big thing, factories, transportation, defense, also important, um, the entire finance system, science and education, agriculture. So these are typical domains in which uh, we do research. And they illustrate that these critical infrastructures, because my chair is called uh, Security for Critical Network Infrastructures, that these critical infrastructures, they're really everywhere, and they are not something, oh yeah, somebody in a company might have a critical infrastructure. No, we have the critical infrastructure. We might even consider our smartphone a critical infrastructure because we're using it every day, but if it would die, we would not die. But if our water is suddenly polluted and so on, it might cause a serious problems. Um, at the chair, therefore, I structured it for Axis, uh, which is trying to make the systems as secure as possible. And the reason why I tell you is, like, when you design software, you can apply similar principles. So try to make it as secure as possible. As the system has autonomous functionality, you cannot anticipate how it will be when you put it into the field. Therefore, you also have to include mechanisms to detect if there are problems which might be a cyber attack or another problem, then you need something to mitigate from it. So it's the third one here. And um, then you should also not forget that the systems are typically fulfilling a purpose for the humans uh, that are using them directly or indirectly. And therefore, you also have to have this interface uh, to the humans ready at that place. Okay. And um, yeah. so now to the, uh, to the ethical aspect, I, I already said something. So there are lots of ethical decisions involved um, when you work on, uh, on this topic. So who's responsible? How can I anticipate what's happening? And uh, yeah, as I also said, there's the, the law direction and many, many more fields um, that are important, especially when it comes to this autonomous functionality, because this autonomous functionality is doing much more than just following a simple rule. It's building a complex distributed system. Mashups are a keyword there, for instance. And these systems are evolving and changing over time, and therefore you really have to have to take um, many, many of the aspects into consideration, and you have a responsibility to take care of that. You don't have to find the solutions to everything, but you're responsible to connect with the people, to discuss it, to make it transparent, and to keep it in mind um, to develop uh, when you develop things. Okay. Good, so as you've seen, um, the next slide is already the program and this is also good because it means we can uh, make a uh, five minutes pause. So first of all, um, thank you all for the, for the attention for the keynote. Do you have, uh, at the end of each keynote, you can clap your hands. <laughs> do, do you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments? Okay, so uh, we are there. You will have many more of the aspects in all the other keynotes uh, during, the, uh, during today. And uh, so I would say, let's make now a um, five minutes break. You can grab something more to eat, you can drink something. And then afterwards, um, we take the uh, PDF of Erkin of the, of the uh, slides and uh, present 
Uh, and then you have three minutes, each of you, for, uh, for presenting them. Um, and Anna has a comment. So I would like to, to make a comment. In my opinion, um, uh, Mark Oliver succeeded in, uh, in highlighting uh, several concepts, very important concepts. Um, and I think, uh, uh, or it's a question maybe, if we can have also the presentations after the, um, after the summer school. Because in my opinion, you, you have uh, um, you have succeeded in outlining exactly the keywords of, of the domain. So I think it, for someone who wants to, to approach more this, uh, this kind of things, it's a good thing to, to follow exactly these keywords. So for me, it was very helpful. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And uh, yeah, so you will, you will get all the transparency and uh, yeah, maybe just leave it there. Did you put it off? Uh, you just put it on, a, just put it off here. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so you will get all the transparency from those that are willing to give them to you. So I will definitely give you these, those. Plus, um, we are live streaming and we'll have the streams afterwards. That means you are really in the luxury situation that you can uh, look it up again afterwards. Um, yeah, exactly. And yeah, I'm very happy for the feedback because I mean, I hoped to, to plant some seeds into your head and they, that they develop a little bit over the week because you will find these aspects in the more focused talks, but the focused talks will probably not show you the entire context and therefore this is what I tried uh, to do with my, uh, with my opening, uh, opening keynote. Um, yeah, so as I said, now it's, it's not so many minutes, but I would still tell you, get up if you want to drink something. Uh, this is also important. Um, we have the fridge in the back. Um, drink it, and if your bottle is empty, please put it back left of the fridge. There are the uh, facilities to put them back because um, we are all responsible for the spaces that we are using, and therefore please use them in a responsible way. Um, we also have, so I just use the time for organizational things now, sorry for that. Um, we also have some uh, t-shirts and quite some goodies for you. The only problem is that there were some uh, problems in getting them on site. That means they will probably arrive tomorrow or latest on Wednesday. I, at least this is what they told me. And uh, there you will also have a uh, drinking bottle, for instance, because we only have uh, bubbled water at the moment, so one that is with gas. But in Germany, the water quality is extremely good. And that means if you don't want water with gas, you can just drink one and then reuse your bottle. There's a, uh, a tap where you, can, uh, where you can get regular water. And uh, in Germany, the regular water from the tap is controlled much more rigidly than the one that you can buy. Plus, um, I personally don't find it a very good idea to support the companies that uh, take the water for free and then sell it to you for uh, a lot of money. And uh, therefore, uh, I decided that we go for that solution. So if you want gassed water, you get it back there. If you don't want it, um, use a tap. Um, in the gift bag, there will also be some, uh, some utilities uh, to do so. Um, so it's now 27. I would say let's reconvene at uh, 35, uh, get a little bit up, walk a little bit around, and uh, we'll get here at 35 um, for the poster presentations. I have to check uh, with Erkin how to get it um, because unluckily he has his lecture during the session where he should present something. Um, but yeah, so I'll do that. Uh, let's reconvene at 35 and uh, yeah, take the break, really get up, move a little bit, and uh, see you in uh, seven minutes.
Okay, uh, so as I said, uh, we want to continue at 35, now it's 38, so we are almost in time. Um, the PhD presentation is uh, something uh, that um, I introduced already in the second year, and uh, the reason why I introduced it is when you do a PhD, or whatever, when you do research, the most difficult thing is the so-called elevator pitch, telling someone in a very limited time what you're doing and making them interested in discussing with you. And this is a very difficult exercise and therefore I uh, try to challenge my students as often as possible to give them the opportunity to improve in that task. And uh, yeah, therefore it's a, it's a very, very good idea um, to always use this opportunity and therefore congratulations already to those um, who provided a poster and who want to use the opportunity, so very good. And uh, the goal, of course, of this one is that you know a little bit with whom are you in the room, what are they doing, uh, do you have some uh, questions to someone who presented something, do you see possibilities for collaboration, uh, do you see that they use some techniques that could be interesting for you, and so on. And uh, therefore, listen attentively. If you want, take some notes of the names, etc. Throughout the week, you will know how the people are called, but they now have the badge also. On the back of your badge, you also have the program, by the way, and the QR code is the website. I will also set up, uh, if I have a minute later, a website where we can share photos and so on, because this is also very interesting. Um, we'll also provide the uh, videos, so if somebody feels uh, willing to uh, record, uh, to cut some videos of the days, uh, also feel free uh, to do so. Okay, so now for the posters. Um, I don't have, unluckily I don't have an overview which is the order of the uh, posters, but uh, this is the uh, first poster. And uh, therefore, the posters will arrive now, and uh, therefore, please uh, come forward uh, if this is you, and then you can present. So, Abbas, are you with us? Can you hear us? Let me have a look. Does anybody know what I have to do and well, what this is? Is it sharing a screen or what is it doing? Okay, maybe I just click here. This looks like something with action. Okay, good. So, okay, Abbas is not there. Then uh, we can go to the next one. Okay, the next one is uh, Sandro. Hi, um, so my name is Sandro. Um, my whole endeavor basically started with a neurobotics platform, which is like simulated brain in a simulated robot in a simulated environment. My idea was use VR hardware to put humans into that same environment. And for that, they obviously need a body. So humanoid robot controlled via VR hardware. Um, to do human robot interaction, for example, because the robot is learning and training in that environment. Um, then um, I was faced with the problem that I need a system that is basically able to represent you in a virtual environment and mediate between you and the virtual body that you have. Because like um, standing up straight up and, and balancing uh, or holding an object that's may maybe too difficult to do it like consciously and control every part of it. So you might even say it's sort of an externalized layer of cognition for you. And that means it's highly personalized and highly individual. And then I thought, 
well, maybe that's applicable to more than just this case and more in general for mixed reality scenarios. And then I started building a framework and then I got into the whole thing of, okay, now I have a framework that is like representing you, embodying you in a virtual or digital cyber environment and is trying to connect with your environment. So it needs to be highly context aware and flexible to adapt because I want to carry it with me and it needs to be super secure because I need to trust it. And that brings me here because I don't have that much contact to the IoT community, so to say. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Sandro. Great uh, presentation, very interesting topic. The next one is uh, Uwe. Uh, Uwe, you can uh, just take the yellow mic that is laying there and just switch it on. There's only one button exactly. Perfect. The floor is yours. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Uwe. I'm from Berlin, from the TU, and uh, academic uh, uh, assistant. Um, I'm in the early stage. And uh, currently, I work with the blockchain uh, Ethereum, and we have some experience to transfer data and payments between uh, IoT devices, uh, which uh, support data from different uh, data providers and uh, shall be sell to consumers. And uh, obviously, uh, if you if you execute a transaction on the blockchain. It costs much money if you execute many transactions in short uh, distances. It costs much more. And therefore, uh, we have smart contracts and uh, payment channels. Um, and we can transfer a small amount of uh, money between the data provider and the uh, data receiver. And this is the current experiment I work on. I want to figure out what are the boundaries, uh, when, when it makes sense to start with, uh, when it doesn't make sense anymore, and in a higher level environment, uh, the, di digi sorry, the digital con Exactly. The currencies um, are uh, uh, kind of hyped. Uh, the blockchain is uh, also a hype, and there are many, many people to earn much money. But the question is, uh, how does it look like uh, in the future? Is the blockchain ready for this digital cur currencies? And yeah, this is the way I want to go. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, an applause, please. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, just keep it running. Yeah, yeah. And the next one is uh, uh, Suryansh. It's pronounced like that. The floor yeah, is yours. You can also call me Suri. I think it's uh, easier Perfect. for everyone in this room. Very good. Um, yeah, so I'm Suri. Uh, I'm a second year PhD researcher at TU Delft in Netherlands. Um, my topic is Internet of Robotic Things. And the whole idea started from mixing uh, IoT with uh, robots, because everyone loves robots. Uh, but also the theme of this uh, school kind of really fits in what my PhD uh, is centered around, which is to treat things as moving, actuated, autonomous systems. So this is more of network robotics, of how different robots can act as a medium for enabling IoT applications, for sensing and communication, for example, in a disaster scenario, where multiple of these agents can coordinate together. Um, so to build up an IoT uh, system around robots, there are a bit of uh, different layers. And what we in my research group have done is we have amphibian agents. So these are robotic agents which can operate on land as well as underwater. And then we use other uh, existing platforms like drones to have a system which can operate in any environment. And my PhD is focused on building up the layers, mostly uh, physical and uh, communication, so basically physical and data link layers, where we enable communication and kind of like information exchange in these platforms. So we have a lot of experience with systems. What we're looking for is other researchers who would like to collaborate with us, uh, 
not only for papers, but also like maybe for other interesting use cases for their research uh, to use these systems in, in, in their uh, application scenarios. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Robert Lawrence. And the next one is Sebastian. OK, hi, everyone. The idea is that nowadays IoT has a big deployment. So we have IoT devices and cloud applications. But when we, we see this deployment between IoT devices and cloud applications, we see a strong dependency between them. That means if we have the cloud application to change, we need to change our IoT devices. Or if they come or appears new IoT devices, the cloud applications need, needs to change. So the idea is to bring this a, a strong dependency with them. Uh, we have talking a middleware to change uh, between the language that is talking the IoT devices and the cloud applications. So as a prelim preliminary work, we have worked with uh, time series uh, representations of the JSON that is talking right now the IoT devices. And we have developed like uh, some templates with uh, a CBOR as technology and we have uh, the prelim preliminary work have showed that we can, with those templates, we can reduce the amount of data sent by the IoT devices between 96% and 76%. So that, that will be the preliminary work. Next, uh, we have to do the real implementation to see if all these things work. So that's the main idea of this. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> and the next one is uh, Razan. Hello, I'm Razan, and I'm doing a PhD in collaboration between Nokia Labs and Inria Paris. And the specific use case I look into is how can robots collaborate together um, in a situation where, for example, let's say we have a natural disaster or something that happened like a building that burnt down, and instead of sending rescuers in, we want to send multiple robots in to build a map of the entire building. So things we want to look into is how can we do this in the minimal amount of time possible. So I look into like exploration and mapping algorithms for these multi-robot systems. But then the question that comes in is, in most algorithms that are there, they've only been tested through simulation, and they haven't considered things like communication and real life scenarios and um, the context of the situation. So what I look into is how can we improve these algorithms um, by taking into account realistic situations like lossy communications, um, and how can we compensate for this loss in our algorithms by, for example, placing relays dynamically um, so that we can minimize the time it takes to complete building our map. Um, so um, that we would take into account as like context awareness. And I basically, in a nutshell, look into context aware algorithms for multi-robot systems. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Perfect, thank you very much. And our next presenter is Dimitri. Yeah, hello, everyone. Thanks uh, for being here. And uh, I will just give a small talk about myself. I'm a second year PhD student at TU Munich. And um, I'm involved in the project related to application of differential privacy as a privacy enhancing technology in social data. And uh, still there are many um, problems and uh, constraints in adopting the compliance measures in any uh, company, any digital process. And I'm trying to reach this gap from a uh, different perspective as a legal researcher and uh, uh, like uh, engineering perspective. So the questions here like um, what are the compliance measures should be adopted while adopting the specific differential privacy technology. How we need to measure the compliance, uh, and uh, this is the twofold question, because we need to get the data utility at the best point of we can, and, uh, and we need to measure the compliance from the GDPR perspective. Of course, there are some already output, so I was trying to set the stage and uh, propose a framework. Uh, it's a theoretical uh, at this point. 
and I'm looking for the application of this theoretical framework. And of course, it could be applied at different stages as a software engineer or privacy engineer. So yeah, that's pretty all. So if you are uh, eager to, you know, to collaborate, just give a shout out on the LinkedIn or whatever. And yeah, nice to see you everybody here. So thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. And the next one is Milko. Yeah, hi, I'm Milko, um, technical uh, PhD student at Technical University. And yeah, the software um, defined paradigm has affected multiple fields. Um, and um, as a result, we replace um, specialized hardware um, by uh, running. Um, um, tailored software on um, generous, um, general purpose hardware. And yeah, in this field, um, my research question is how to assign real time uh, timing semantics uh, to event based task sequences in distributed industrial uh, machine control systems. And yeah, in this field, I would like to talk to you about. Um, how um, can a suitable machine learning algorithm solve um, these kind of problems? For example, the problem of um, the partitioned uh, multiprocessor scheduling algorithm or other NP hard um, problems. And there, I also would like to talk to you about guarantees and optimality because I think that's really important and interesting uh, when we want to apply machine learning algorithm in the future. Um, yeah, what I'm also interested is uh, interested in is um, like yeah safety topics in the field of adaptive systems and your research and you and yeah let's have a great time. Um, yeah, nice to be here and I'm looking forward to spend some days with you. Perfect, thank you very much, Mirko. <laughs> the next one is Marvin. Yeah, hello, I'm Marvin from the University of Oldenburg, the Department of um, System Software and Distributed Systems. I work at, the, yeah, at a problem where, where an autonomous vehicle has to follow a path, a predefined path, and we have to, be, uh, to follow this path as precisely as possible. And um, when a vehicle follows a path or senses its, its uh, position, it usually uses GPS, and for its own attitude, it uses the gravity vector or the magnetic field vector. And um, the magnetic field vector is affected by an error. We have to calibrate it, and we are trying to get rid of the um, yeah, magnetic field um, by using reference points in, by using uh, multiple GPS positions. Um, traditionally, you have a vehicle and using a second GPS position, draw a line on your map and get the attitude of the vehicle. And uh, our approach is, to move the second point of a vehicle to another vehicle and communicate with each other to uh, add a mechanism to sense another vehicle and estimate the, the angle here. And um, if we add multiple vehicles here, we can draw geometric forms on our map and by that um, we yeah, use mathematic um, trigonometry and other approaches to, um, yeah, to get our own attitude in that direction. And uh, yeah, the research questions is how many vehicles I need, uh, how can this be applied into the reality, and uh, what's, uh, what, what are the use cases the system could be used to. So uh, we are looking for yeah, some uh, systems to verificate our approaches and our algorithms behind it. Thanks a lot, and nice to be here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and the next one is uh, Juliette. Hi, uh, I'm Juliette. I come from France, from EMT Atlantic, and my subject is about uh, collective intelligence strategies for industrial autonomous vehicles. And my objective is to design and develop intelligent cooperative algorithms to dynamically perform um, collective decision making for traffic constraints. And um, these cooperative uh, algorithms uh, relied on standardized messages from ETS 
And um, the goal is to ensure interoperability in environments, in industry, and with uh, heterogeneous uh, robots. Uh, and uh, the other objective is to to um, to ensure the um, the possibility that every robot can co can communicate with uh, standardized messages to to I don't know to <laughs> to adapt with the traffic constraints. So nice to meet you and uh, enjoy. Perfect. Thank you. And the next one is Jose. Hello, everyone. This is Jose, all the way from Peru. And currently, I'm a student from PhD in the Technical University of Munich. And today, I would like to introduce about my research topic, which is about uh, multi-personalized menus. So suppose like um, in in here in Europe, uh, there are many people who have many uh, food restrictions. And you have some allergies or some food intolerance. And you want to go to a restaurant, right? But um, you cannot find the, the, I mean, the safe uh, food options for you. Maybe you don't know about the content of the, of the ingredients of the, pro of the products. But what if we can see a, a software like can uh, scan those menus, put it in the digital menus, and then you can introduce in a very simple web form your own, your food profile, like what you can eat, what you cannot eat. And then uh, there will be a machine learning algorithm that can match your food uh, intolerance, your food profile with those uh, digital menus. So that's what I'm doing now in my research. Uh, we are creating this uh, machine learning with some uh, uh, programming stuff to, to try to match those um, restrictions with those menus, and we can create a, a valid food option for you. So this is our topic in our lab uh, for the Department of Bioinformatics in TUM. And if someone wants to join us also, welcome, because we are also about to create a GmbH uh, enterprise about this. So welcome. Uh, ha happy to see you here. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the next one is Lucas. Now it's on. Uh, hello together, my name is Lukas. I'm from Germany. So right now I live in Munich, which is also where I do my PhD um, at Siemens. But I also have a university by my side, so it's the FIU Erlangen Nuremberg. So most of the time I'm in Munich, sometimes in Nuremberg. And yeah, my research is mostly about computer vision and robotics. And also my main research project is by um, the FIU and Siemens, but also Tom is involved and uh, Fraunhofer Institute. And yeah, basically the goal is to flexibly and environmental friendly produce um, power modules. And especially my job next to all these um, interesting research areas in this project is to actually build this um, yeah, manufacturing cell. So um, the manufacturing cells should flexibly produce power modules and therefore I have um, yeah the setup you can see here so to break it down I have two robots which both grasp um, yeah um, electronic devices very small parts they have to bring them together under a laser um, where they are then then connected by welding so yeah I came up with the research question how can a flexible manufacturing system for power modules be realized and optimized in terms of robustness. So I'm still in an early phase of my project, so you can help me by any information about similar projects, so about electronic production, computer vision projects to uh, make robots more precise. And yeah, so this is one project, but I also have some other projects I work on. So it's, it's about um, defect detection um, and different manufacturing processes so what I show here is a project still from a master thesis where I developed a, um, yeah, a labeling pipeline, a semi-automatic labeling pipeline for um, yeah, labeling images for defect detection here for cutting tools used in machining. So I'm also happy to talk about this project and I'm happy to, yeah, looking forward to the next days and getting to know you guys. 
Thanks. Thank you very much. And the next one is Ivan. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'm a PhD student. I came from Brazil, but uh, I'm come from not so far right now because I'm doing my PhD at the University of Bologna in Italy. And basically, I'm investigate about IoT edge caching. So we know that we uh, we talk or heard some talks about like. A, machines communicating with machines, machines communicating with applications, and one main point of those communications is time, right? So a robot cannot expect, uh, wait a long time for another robot to finish, they need data in a, uh, small latency and so on. Uh, initially, we uh, offload computation to the cloud, right? And latency was a major problem. So then came the edge, and we have like shorter latency. But it's still, uh, some applications are third power or don't control. So how can we deal with that? So uh, a way of dealing with that is deploying at edge at, uh, deploying a caching layer at the edge. But uh, not so, just that, we can do better than that. Uh, so how about we start to collect some data about the device and start to proactive caching data. So before, the machines, the applications, the request for data, we uh, detect that, we cache that data automatically and reduce latency by uh, all lo uh, by mm, lo lots and lots of time and that improves and enables several systems, right? So that uh, is in general my uh, research topic. I'm looking for collaboration, cool ideas and so on. Thanks. Thank you very much, perfect. And the next one is Hassan. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Hassan Hamoud. I'm a PhD student in University of Rennes in France. My PhD topic talks about agile data collection for precision agri-ecology. Uh, it's an uh, NRI, NRI joint study. Uh, it talks about the, uh, the module implemented in the, uh, in the field. Uh, it talks with the Riot uh, operating system that talks with the microservices. The aim is to increase the number of nodes in the field uh, with the aim to have a robustness mesh network with an orchestration of microservices, taking into consideration a local processing with a local storing in the aim to enhance the, uh, the services. So uh, now uh, I can show you uh, the implemented uh, uh, modules in the field. It captures uh, data uh, with the, with the uh, taking into consideration uh, the energy consumption that uh, the, these uh, uh, modules uh, worked for a long time and now we are working on enhancing this point. Thank you. And I'm happy to be with you. Thank you very much. And the next one is Chuan uh, Chi. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first, I need to state that I'm not um, a PhD student yet. I'm a still a master student. Uh, I'm uh, currently uh, doing my master thesis. Uh, at the ODS chair at uh, TU Berlin. Uh, and my current topic is about how to build a P2P RDF engine, uh, RDF store for the lightweight edge devices. Uh, yeah, as we know, the somatic waves and um, is full of the, uh, the RDF data, the RDF data model is used to describe and um, uh, the data on the somatic waves. Um, and um, and RDF, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> This idea for LED is a centralized IDF engine that it used to um, store um, IDF data and, uh, and it's able to query um, IDF data from that engine, but it's still a problem how to incorporate more devices uh, and incorporate um, uh, a large scale of data. Uh, and so we uh, propose that we can use a P2P system uh, to combine with this centralized uh, IDF engine to make it our um, 
to turn it into a distributed IDF engine. Uh, and among the P2P system, we, uh, we chose the PGRID, um, PGRID system uh, because of its um, unique uh, in the query processing. Uh, right. <laughs> And uh, it is expected that our, uh, this integration will provide um, benefits such as scalability, uh, robustness, and load balance for a network f uh, full of um, lightweight edge devices. And um, I think our topic will be extended in the future um, around um, the operator placement. Uh, which can be uh, used by the methods of machine learning and also uh, uh, we are also considering uh, to improve the um, performance of the p 2 systems like how to um, how to improve the fault tolerance or uh, the other the other aspects of this system yeah that's uh, things as much rather <laughs> perfect very good and uh... <laughs> You, you really cover uh, all a uh, wide field um, linked to autonomy, which is totally great. Um, so the next one is Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Emmanuel, and uh, I'm a PhD student at Sapienza University of Rome in Italy. And uh, when you think about IoT, you always think about uh, smart homes and connected buildings and stuff. But what happens when you bring IoT underwater? So. This is my uh, general research topics, and uh, we, uh, in our lab, focus on com communication underwater, and uh, our particular uh, specialty is um, communication via acoustic modems. And we are open to uh, explore also hybrid system, so both acoustic and laser uh, communication techniques. And uh, in my uh, particular work focuses on networking protocols. And uh, so we're speaking uh, routing uh, techniques and schemes uh, in this kind of uh, networks. So um, I'm happy to uh, be here with you. And uh, I've also seen that uh, there are some uh, colleagues that work on uh, this kind of uh, robots because um, our uh, focus also uh, comprises not only static networks, but also uh, ones that have moving parts. And this kind of parts are uh, underwater drones that may be either teleoperated by a human operator, but also uh, working in complete uh, autonomous way. So uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, happy to be here again. Thank you very much. And the next one is Charles. Hello, my name is Thomas. I am research director, and I teach IoT classes to students all over the world. Oh, the students, they love my printed circuit boards. But they were not designed for them. They cannot go into them. Hi, my name is Patricia. I am an HVAC PhD student. And I would like to validate a design building, a building design, but I do not have the data for that. Hi, my name is Francois. I am the director of an engineering school in a tropical area. Our building has no AC, but it is still very cool. I would love to publish a paper about the, build, the design of the building, but the gathering of the data is so tedious, and I would love so much to have my students work on the data. I need something. Hi, my name is Charles. I am a master's degree student, and this is IIoT, the all-in-one educational IoT tool you need. Um, this is a simple illustration of the solution. So IoT comprises of two protein circuit boards. They send data to each other, like temperature, humidity, and stuff. And they send all the data from one mode to each other up to a gateway, where the, the data is centralized and then process to whatever you want. You can just upload it to the cloud, you can feed it into an AI program, whatever, the possibilities are endless. This solution is super easy to use. As a matter of fact, the, UI, the UX comprises of only four steps. Can you believe it? You order them from the internet, just like any Amazon thing. Then you open the box, the parcel. You fit these double batteries, the most regular batteries you can think of and you just have to deploy them in your building. The chips 
the microcontrollers on these boards, will start to create a network dynamically. And no matter where you put them in the bending, they will find a way to send the data from one neighbor to another, and then to other neighbors, and then ultimately to the gateway. And this is all done automatically. It is an absolutely seamless integration. And it's not even that expensive. Each of these boards is below 40 euros, depending on the, of course, on the, of the sensor that you want on them. So we have two boards. The biggest one, which I like to call the big boy, is the IIoT Play. This one is designed for the students, really. As you can see, there is a, this huge breadboard on it on which students will have a wonderful time experimenting and programming sensors. And the other one is the IIoT Pico. This one is very cute. If you don't know anything about IoT, you can use it, and you will start gather, collecting data in a day. Um, currently, the hardware design is done. Uh, the firmware is well underway, and we need to test the product and market it. Uh, if you'd like to be part of the IIoT family, you are more than welcome to email us. We would love to have you on board. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the next one is Catherine. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm German, although my first name sounds French. Um, please call me Kate. I'm also from the TU Munich. Um, currently, I just started my second year of my PhD in the field of process mining. So a bit of an exit here, maybe. Um, I focus um, on compliance um, checking with in-process mining. So I work a lot with NLP on the one hand side, um, regulatory documents like laws, ISO norms, and I want to check if the business process um, event logs that I have on the other side are conform with this. Currently, I focus on the event logs, but in the future, that's why I'm here, I also um, plan to do um, event streams, so real time and um, also go in the prediction area, so hopefully I learned some stuff about that here. Maybe I'm quickly um, a bit more in input to my two projects I worked on so far. So the first one, the first paper I was focusing on really text to text. So um, on the one hand side I had the GDPR, the General Data Protection Policy from the EU, which is a really big document about companies having to protect the data of the clients and stuff. And on the other hand, um, every company has to write their own data protection policies, so how they want to implement this GDPR. And I compared those two text documents on a really uh, deep dive level. So from the process perspective, not only is, is the topic available in the data protection policy, but um, does the correct role implement this um, action? Is the action correctly implemented in the right time frame? So really, um, deep dive into NLP. And um, my current paper is focusing more on the event log side. So I have an event log where violations are identified, but um, the use case is the stakeholders don't know where the violations originate from. So uh, I first apply some adjusted decision mining, you could say, um, decision tree algorithm to identify rules explaining the violations. And the second step is then connecting more to my first paper, where these rules that I identified are um, connected to the regulatory documents. Again, are they originating like from a law or something that defines what these parameters that were violated need to be like? So that's my current work. But yeah, hopefully I work more with event streams in the future. Thanks. Well, very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> and the next one is uh, Samia. Yes, hi everyone. I'm uh, Samia. I'm a first year PhD student at EMT Atlantic of Nantes. And uh, at the same time, in the context of my industrial disease, I work as a security researcher at uh, R&D Center of Ericsson in uh, Paris. So the topic of my PhD, uh, of my PhD is uh, secure deployments of microservices in shared cloud-run multi-access uh, edge computing environments. So uh, the idea is, um, the idea came with the extension of the storage, computing, and processing capabilities of the central cloud to the edge uh, of the uh, cellular networks. 
uh, and with the virtualization of the, of the network functions. So the idea here is uh, to how to secure the deployments of the network functions, especially of the 5G and beyond architecture in uh, edge uh, cloud environments. So my main questions for that is, uh, can we really consider uh, such environments, I mean the, of the edge uh, of the multi access edge computing as uh, secure and trusted for uh, deploying our new architecture? So in um, summary, th uh, this is all. Thank you, and uh, nice to be here with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the next one is Anna. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you. I'm Ana Maria Dragulinescu. I am a lecturer at the Faculty of Electronics, Telecommunications and Information Technology, uh, more precisely in the Telecommunications Department. And uh, since uh, June 2022, I mean June this year, uh, I was also officially involved uh, as a team member in AI Multimedia Lab. Uh, also, I am not a... I'm not a PhD student anymore, but I'm a postdoc. And um, I was also a, a team member of the team that won the hackathon in 2019. So I want to first to, to tell you that this summer school may be a good trigger for you to go further with your PhD thesis, because this is was also for me. It was a very good, uh, a very good trigger. So my PhD thesis was about uh, uh, IoT-based, uh, in fact, uh, VSNE, Fanet, Sanet-based uh, IoT platforms. Uh, what is uh, this kind of hybrid network? I mean, it's a, um, it's a good cooperation between wireless sensor networks, flying ad hoc networks, and uh, surface ad hoc networks. And my research question was then, is it feasible to develop such IoT platforms based also on LoRa communications coexisting with other technologies? And as a, as a main result, I have uh, succeeded in developing uh, such an innovative platform and uh, also to propose an optimal uh, uh, placement algorithm for uh, the unmanned aerial vehicles and uh, unmanned surface vehicles on short drones and boats. Uh, in order to serve uh, the wireless sensor networks that were deployed in uh, harsh environments or hard to reach areas, um, also, I develop a physical prototype to perform a measurement campaign with, uh, with LoRa communication. And, uh, of course, I have uh, presented the, the results and some mathematical models for, uh, uh, based on this measurement campaign. Um, also, other achievements uh, as a PhD may, uh, uh, I were mentioning, uh, um, another contest, Academia Industry Contest, I participated in, uh, was uh, Tech Challenge 2019. Um, as uh, near future plans, as you see, I am going uh, this, uh, I think it's one week uh, till I go to Tunis to an exchange inside the AI for Media project. Um, AI uh, Multimedia Lab is a member of this consortium. Uh, I will go there in order to, to start my research on uh, reinforcement learning and multimedia networks. Uh, as you see, I, uh, I made, uh, let's say, uh, a little change in, in my research topic. Uh, but this happens because, in my opinion, IoT cannot uh, develop further without machine learning, as Mark Oliver uh, told to us. Um, so, of course, in my opinion, uh, you should uh, also be interested in, in this topic. So uh, this is why I'm, I'm going to Nice. I'm going to, uh, uh, to cope with uh, optimal network control in multimedia networks. And also because I'm, uh, I'm so curious of uh, converting my problem, my PhD problem and research topic into a reinforcement learning problem. Um, as a long-term plan, I, I plan also to, uh, to cope with uh, Tini ML. I'm very interested because I'm uh, uh, both a hardware and software enthusiast. 
So as many of you, I like uh, doing uh, practical things, not only software or simulations. So these are my plans. Of course, I can talk uh, the entire day about me and about my plans. Uh, but I, I must thank you for your, for your patience and for your attention. And of course, I'm here to, to talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, the next one is Amani. So hello, everyone. My name is Amani Aboreda. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, University of Strasbourg. Uh, my PhD topic is about explainable anomaly detection for cybersecurity uh, using a graph analysis. To, if you are aware about the graphs and why we are using a graph, uh, the first uh, thing is from data science perspective, we are having uh, everything connected, So, and we are having also the IoT uh, devices, which means that we need a complex uh, network to represent our data, and this is why we are using the graphs. And also from cybersecurity perspective, uh, let's take the example of a NotPD attack which happened uh, in 2017 in Ukraine. Uh, so if an attacker have uh, access to one of your nodes and one of your network, he can have access to the whole graph. And this is why we are a defender and we, know we need to also to think as a graph in order to defend our uh, systems. Uh, so our main objective were first to detect the advanced uh, attack using uh, graph learning uh, models. And in our uh, methodology, we have used the three main uh, graph analysis and the graph embedding and the graph neural network. And we also compared these uh, models in order to see which one have uh, better performance and accuracy and time to detect such anomalies. And we are also building an explainable and interpretable models in order to have the trusted AI. Uh, which is very useful in order to make our prediction understandable by humans. Uh, and these are some of the results that, that we currently have, and we are now uh, planning to build a cybersecurity application in order to have the explainable and interpretable anomaly detection for the cybersecurity audience. And if someone is interested, you can also contact us for some collaboration. Um, and thank you all. Thank you very much, Amani. <laughs> And tomorrow we'll also have a keynote by uh, Pierre Perron on, uh, related to this topic. Um, the next one is uh, Said. Hello everyone, nice to meet you. My name is Said Alvarado. I am from Venezuela and I am a PhD student in the INRIA Research Institute in Paris, France. I work with the IO team, which is a team that specializes in IoT networks. My PhD is about multi-robot coordination in network constrained environments. I am actually rather a new PhD student. I only started like four months ago. Uh, before that, I was an engineer in the same research team. And as my job, I was tasked to design these little robots, which are very tiny, inexpensive robotic platforms with teeny tiny Bluetooth radios. So the point of the PhD is that now we have a bunch of them. And we would like to, to use as an experimental platform to explore collaborative path planning algorithms for actual robots actually implemented in an uh, experimental platform. Right now, specifically, I am working in designing a localization system for them based on the Lighthouse technology, which is the same technology they use in VR headsets for virtual reality games to locate the player as it moves. It is a pretty nifty technology because you get to paste two beacons on the corners of the room, and it sweeps the area with laser pulses. The robots can detect it, and they can locate themselves with millimeter accuracy. It is a really cool technology and quite a challenge to actually get working in practice. But it's a very fun challenge to do. Anyways, thanks for listening. I am very happy to be here and meet you all. Thank you very much. And uh, this was in my slide, that the last slide. Anybody missing who wants to present online or offline? Okay, good. That's perfect. Um, because we're also very well in time, let me just switch back to the agenda. So. Uh,
as, you, as you might have seen if you looked in the uh, first, first of all, feedback on the presentations. So it was very good. You all prepared uh, very well, and uh, I enjoyed also the different presentation styles with uh, some uh, scenic elements and. Uh, it's, it's always interesting to look um, at how do other people present something because you always find something that you like or that you don't like that you do yourself or want to do and it's always a good opportunity to really, to really do that. And you all have super interesting PhD topics. As I made cl clear in the beginning, they are all very well related to autonomous uh, computing, to autonomy. And uh, yeah, really use the opportunity to exchange with the others. Uh, the methodologies you all use uh, have certainly some overlaps. The people are very interesting, as I could already see, so uh, really use it. OK, so now it's um, uh, time for going for lunch. So the lunch is in the, uh, um, the restaurant that is called Eins, because it's a restaurant of the RRD, the German uh, uh, general broadcasting um, uh, institutions of Germany, which is directly the building next to us. The restaurant is, we exit the building, so we go down the stairs, here's the exit, and then it's in that direction, and there you saw already is the bridge, and it's already before the bridge on the right, and then it's directly there. So it's like where my finger points, so out of the building, that direction, and then to the right, we'll walk there together, I don't know if uh, Tim or Samira are there to walk uh, with us. Otherwise, just um, follow me and uh, we'll, we'll walk there. Um, yeah, so the plan is to, to continue then afterwards at one o'clock. So we have uh, one and a half hours, which uh, should be fine, especially given that the restaurant is super close. Um, so please be back at one o'clock then afterwards. For the PhD posters, um, I can put them already in the back, so you see them there, and the idea is that you uh, also gather in the back um, from time to time, you look there, you can discuss with the people on the PhD posters. All right, good. Are there any questions, yes? What is about our bags and what is about our bags and technical stuff? Can we store it here? Uh, yes, you can uh, store everything here because I have the key. So I will lock uh, the room so you can uh, leave everything in here. I will uh, lock the door. Ah, Tim arrived. Perfect. Um, so Tim is the guy in the back with the uh, wood cutting uh, shirt, however it's called. Yeah. <laughs> will, will you go with us to the restaurant? Okay, perfect. But I told the people that we will slowly walk there now, uh, and uh, that's fine. Yeah, I explained to them already. Perfect. But you go with us? OK, perfect. So then, uh, then we go with Tim, who is uh, from here, and uh, he uh, shows us. Perfect. OK, good. And you can leave everything here. I will lock the door, and we will only be able to enter again once I'm back, because here's the key. Okay, thank you very much.
So we are slowly starting, so please get back and ready. So for the uh, challenges, those teams who already have some progress after the presentation of the challenges, you are cordially invited to briefly present it to the other teams. Um, Fabian and uh, Lars will say you much more about it, but we'll have multiple sync points also during the week, which from a didactical point of view have the background that you see what the other teams are doing, how they're organizing, and you might get inspired by that. And that said, I hand over directly to uh, Fabian and Lars uh, for presenting uh, and moderating the challenges. Thank you. Um, yeah. This one? Perfect. So, Antonello, yeah, you are the first one. You are not prepared? Okay, let's start. So, first of all, welcome also from my side. Um, yeah, we are here together with our colleagues EMT Atlantic and, and TU Munich and so on. And yeah, from Siemens, what I said before, uh, welcome. We also set up a challenge for you and Antonello will give in a few seconds um, uh, some insights about autonomous guided vehicles for the factory of the future. And afterwards, we will see also some insights from the other challenges. The idea is that every participant understand a little bit what is going on in the other challenges. And um, you can also give some updates about the current status, um, what you did over the last week, for example, together with the PhDs, and what is the idea now for the upcoming week. So, and with these words, I would like to hand over to Antonello. Thank you, Fabian. Okay, just a second. Okay. Do we have like an, an, an clicker to go further with the presentation? Mark? Okay, thank you. Let me try it. Oh, okay, nice. Okay, so welcome from my side. Um, I'm here with my colleagues from Siemens Nuremberg headquarter, and uh, let me just introduce you to our overwhelming idea about robots, because our initial um, intention to go, to do such great challenges with you guys is that we are thinking about robots in environments like IoT, Industrial 4.0, and we want to um, take a look more from the IT perspective without losing all the cool stuff from the OT world, all the safety things, for example. And we develop and drive the topics about flexible production in Siemens and try to look around with the scope of a few years what we can do. So the challenges I will now introduce to you are directly part of our, fu uh, our future and our idea, business idea behind everything regarding robotics. So here you can see the starting point. We started with a Siemens prototype robot arm on the left, uh, just mounted really rudimentary on a pallet. Then we had some fancy student ma magic. We will talk tomorrow more about our students. But here on the right side, you can now take a look at our so-called OCP AGV, which stands for Open Controller Platform, which is something we will dive into uh, tomorrow. And here, I hope, the video is playing on the right side. You can see Benjamin just controlling the first time the robot arm of our AGV. 
and delivering uh, you some fine beer. <laughs> okay, so um, for those who are familiar with robotics, we've seen a lot of, about robots and especially multi-robot systems. We are working here with, ro uh, with the robot operating system two and the next robot we have here, especially two in the back, are the so-called IoT bots, which are pretty small, which are, are like our, um, let's say, development and research platform inside internally for Siemens to get in touch with the robot operating system, develop our Siemens products and validate them for how we can do it. And the second of our challenge will take part on this small robot. Let's say it's a small Raspberry Pi inside and we will do some cool things. And exactly, oh, god damn, here. Okay, the first and major task the, uh, the most of our students will be on the OCP HUV. We have it here just in the back, and the key aspects is, are of obviously on this uh, vehicle and robot arm attached to it, and the challenge will be that we will determine with the depth cameras and with AI algorithms how we can achieve some kind of flexible grasping. So you don't have always to teach the robot arm to grasp, for example, an egg and tomorrow a sponge, the, so that the robot arm can do it by its own, like detecting some uh, some objects and some some cool um, angles to grab the object and or to feel the softness of the objects. The next um, task will be on our small IoT bots. We have them equipped with lidar sensory, which means that the robots have like a 360 degree angle of view, and we have already developed everything for cartographing, for example, this room, and the challenge will be to make a map of this building and to let the robot navigate in it. And maybe that's the reason why we have two of them here, to let them navigate together. So that was the challenge from my side. I'm not sure, shall I just um, talk about the first kickoff, or is this like oh, in half an hour, okay. So we started last week with all of our students, had a kickoff, this is like the initial stages that we talked together and um, like talked what are your intentions, what are your wishes, why do, are you here, and what do we plan to do here in this week. And we already like determined like the second uh, task was initially never planned, but in the discussion it came around that would be cool, so the status is that all of our students and we already built some small teams and we already have uh, developed a plan what we want to achieve this week and show to you guys. Last, uh, last is our uh, current status from today. As you notice, maybe we weren't so present in the first hours today because our big boy had um, small transportation problems, but we have, an, uh, we have a solution for it and here you can see our small robot in its, let's say, battle mode. We will tell you more about tomorrow, already equipped with a lighter sensory. That's the current state, and we are happy to be here and happy to see all of our students in person. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Antonello. Are there some questions from the audience? Okay, if not, then we will come directly to the second challenge, is automated analysis and synthesis of multimedia data, and Lars will give some insights of it. Yes, uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Lars, and I will be heading this challenge, and I don't have a fancy slide set prepared, because we have this fancy setup prepared for you. So this challenge will involve working on this live stream that is coming out of this uh, yeah out of this phd school and uh, while we are now doing manual tweeting uh, for this tweet wall we're trying to automate it and therefore our challenge will be to analyze the stream in real time and uh, process it for, uh, for for example for specific keywords and actually also determine a very nice picture for it as well to automatically create screenshots annotated with quotes depending on the buzzwords and then automatically tweet them to our tweet wall. So in an optimum case, 
uh, by the end of the week or even sooner than that, uh, we might be able to actually automatically post to social media um, using this setup here and uh, lots of great technology, uh, for example, also provided by AWS and uh, I'm very excited to see what the team will come with, up with. Do you would like to add something, Mark? Uh, yeah, so I, uh, <clears throat> I, I just wanted to add this challenge. We already had some teams working on it last year, and last year they worked on uh, you know, analyzing the YouTube and doing something with it. And uh, th this year, in addition to what Lars said, the idea would be to have a uh, an interface where you see some pictures it took with the AWS. We can even do face recognition, so we can know in which parts of an image is probably a face, and then we could cut it. We could use the live stream. We could also use uh, webcams that we have available, that we use a 4K webcam, for instance, and cut a piece out, and to uh, analyze the speech so that we have the phrases, so that for those who want to do the social media comments or some meme iconic pictures that they can just click it together, edit it a bit and then send it. From last year we know already that it works, we have the code from last year and the idea is to build on top of that uh, with that challenge. For the, uh, yeah, so that was it for that one. Uh, I'm not connected anymore, let me reconnect. Uh, you can moderate. <laughs> Thank you. So are there some questions from the audience? No, then we have to switch back to number one because we will come to challenge number three and this is from the IMT Atlantic and it's autonomous. Okay, it's an autonomous machine to human signaling via integration of low cost IoT hardware via Bluetooth and infrared. And Akin, you will give some insights, or? I'm right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, Okay, I was thinking to give this together with Professor Paul, so I've been assigned to this in the last minute. Um, let me tell you the big picture, because there's a quite fancy title, Autonomous Machine to Human Signaling via Integration of Low-Cost IoT Hardware via Bluetooth and Infrared. So what we want to do is, here I'm speaking, I'm a speaker, I'm, I will address some audience, and then we want to inform the speaker with the remaining time. We have some gadgets, we have some lights, we have some uh, digits back there, it says, okay, one minute left, 10 minutes left, um, 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 so what we want to do is you wa we want you to design uh, such system so that the speaker get informed uh, the duration of uh, how much left in his uh, speak. Um, as I said, we will uh, uh, provide you some hardware. You will put Raspberry Pi uh, in between, so it will be the uh, uh, main station to send, the send mm -hmm. and receive the signals. And we will also have a gadget uh, that acts as a MQTT broker. Yesterday I tried to figure out how does it work. I couldn't, so because I was alone. But you are working in a challenge for five people, right? So you will be able to do it uh, better than I. Uh, there is a blog post written in German. I guess we have some native German speakers in the challenge as well that they can translate, or you can use Google Translator, uh, whatever you want. Um, so I will also provide you that blog post, and then uh, hopefully see uh, uh, this system works. Uh, one key thing uh, for the challengers, I think this uh, applies to everybody, reusability is very important. So we want to see the pr progress over time. So uh, uh, please document everything you do, uh, such that, for example, next time we give this same challenge to someone else, he can continue where you left off, right? So we don't want everybody to start from scratch. And uh, this challenge is also something that we started last year, and as Akin said, we already have the MQTT gateway, we have the Eric clock and the Eric clock, and they can be controlled by infrared, and uh, we have some uh, bar like this that is showing the progress, and the idea there is to mount it um, somewhere that you can see how much time is remaining for the talk, <clears throat> because I find that always quite useful at the same time. Putting like a clock here is a little bit unnerving, but if you have like this progress bar, that might be something interesting. And we also have some more gadgets there. And the background of the challenge is to um, reverse engineer the protocols because we have uh, Bluetooth and uh, we have infrared and uh, Wi-Fi. Um, the Wi-Fi is clear because it's MQTT, but apart from that, it's a proprietary something. And if you do IoT, it's often that you have off-the-shelf hardware that you don't 
know the, you don't have any standard that is used and you have to reverse engineer what they do. Often the protocols are quite trivial, luckily, and uh, this is what is behind the challenge a little bit. And the documentation stuff is, as I can said, for all challenges, it's important to document, not because we want to reuse the challenge, but because it's a very good learning outcome for you also to do the documentation, because it's always painful, but at the same time, I always tell the student, documentation is part of the creative process. Because if you document it and you say, okay, this is how we designed it, this is how you launch it, you have to rethink it, and this helps you to improve the solution. Okay, good, thank you very much, Ekin. Thank you. Okay, then let's come to the fourth challenge. It's from FUB, and it's about IoT fleet management. Emmanuel, please come to the stage and give us some insights. Yeah, you can. Hi, so uh, um, we're delighted to be here. I'm uh, Emmanuel, um, and back uh, there, there's Kuhn and Casper. And so we work for a number of institutions in Ria Freie Universität Berlin. And also, uh, we have this uh, nice uh, Einstein Center um, logo here. So um, I want to take another angle with this challenge uh, uh, concerning autonomy in IoT. And one part of uh, another angle of tackling autonomy is actually empowering a IoT end users to be autonomous. And um, uh, right now they're a little bit like enslaved in various uh, verticals and uh, walled gardens. And um, so um, one challenge, uh, uh, one, one thing that um, especially exacerbates this uh, challenge of empowering end users is when uh, really low power devices come into the mix of your system. And by that I mean uh, microcontroller uh, based devices, right? So uh, these are devices that have, uh, as most of you know, uh, much less uh, computational power than uh, Raspberry Pi or things like that. And you, you don't program them in the same way. Uh, you can't use Linux, you can't even use like uh, IP protocols uh, like you use them uh, elsewhere and you can still use them, but you have to do something else. And you have a number of, of of uh, radios that are a little bit exotic for some of them uh, to communicate with these devices. Uh, so in this context, what does it mean to empower uh, end users to become more autonomous uh, in, in this sense? So w one thing that you, first thing you, you need to think about is like how you're going to uh, reprogram uh, these devices uh, the way you want it. Like, uh, like you, if you have a laptop, you, you don't care what's on there. They can flash Linux and uh, you know run with it. So, what's the equivalent of that on these devices? Though there are equivalents of that, um, which are uh, technically different, but they play the same role. Uh, exam example: one example is Riot. Uh, there's also Zephyr, things like that. Okay. So, once you can actually um, have control on that, and you're autonomous in terms of what programs uh, are running on these devices. Uh, then you also need to securely connect to them, right? So um, uh, uh, there, um, you need some uh, open communication standards, and I guess you are familiar with uh, some of these. Um, uh, you can use IP here, um, and, and uh, with uh, add-ons like uh, six low pan and uh, things like that. And so this is, uh, you can securely connect to these things to the device, but now, uh, how do you manage and configure these devices? Uh, one, how do you onboard them in your in your in your system? So this is this is the challenge uh, that we want to uh, address here. Um, and um, today's standpoint is that 
you can probably um, manually configure your, your device one by one, but uh, it becomes uh, an ordeal very fast. Uh, even just a small, you know, smart house uh, deployment is, is really cumbersome, if not a challenge in itself. So um, the challenge that uh, we propose is um, uh, to tackle this goal uh, of conveniently orchestrating, auto-configurating uh, uh, the a fleet of IoT devices uh, from small to larger. Um, and the mission here in this context um, is to draft an architecture for managing a fleet of devices, right? That would build on top as much as possible of open source and open standards uh, in terms of, of protocols. So, uh, for example, CoreConf or Lightweight M2M on top of CoAP are, are two um, uh, possibilities that we recommend to look at, for example. Um, yeah, the expected outcome, uh, two words on that. Uh, so obviously an architecture that you need to, to pitch and, uh, and, and detail. So this is like slideware, um, and this must allow uh, some form of orchestration and configuration of single devices up to medium, small, medium, large fleets of IoT devices. And um, if possible, a small, some running code with a proof of concept, even though this is like uh, the, uh, not um, uh, absolutely mandatory. Uh, I'll just uh, say a few words, more words on that. And what kind of things should this architecture provide? Um, monitoring some network, what network activity on devices from remotely, um, you know, uh, do some collaborative measurements, uh, spreading some s software updates on, on these devices too. Um, things like that, okay? Uh, and in terms of uh, expected outcome, uh, the approach we should take, it's like it's, it's, it's a summer school, so you're supposed to learn something. So uh, this is, should be uh, um, primarily your goal to learn stuff. And here, like, what's important is to try to tackle uh, this problem of, of fleet management with uh, all the aspects that need to be taken into account due to the constraints of, that you have typically on these, de on these devices. Right? So these constraints uh, uh, include but are not limited to uh, uh, lossy networks, ultra low power uh, that you need to uh, be able to uh, perform on these devices and some constraints on the CPU and memory, etc. Okay, so and there's we put like less importance on uh, the actual code that you'll have running at the end, although this should be possible, uh, and more importance on reasoning. Uh, uh, the reasoning behind your, the, your, the choices that you make for your protocol architecture and deployment architecture, okay? And what kind of trade-offs you identify. Okay, and the starting points, uh, so you'll be provided a, with a bunch of these boards, which are uh, some low-power Cortex-M based uh, um, microcontroller, uh, um, and a pretty popular type of boards. Uh, so you have a small, small fleet. Uh, you can also add your own device. If you want, um, this open source uh, the base that we provide is, is based on Riot. There's a branch there that you can use uh, to tinker. Um, yeah, and, and you have a, a, a network stack that's already there that you can use as base. All right, and so we look forward to, to meet you. Uh, uh, for those who are on site, uh, those who are online, we can uh, interact uh, via our chat room, uh, so uh, we want to use Matrix. This is the uh, handle to, to get on, and uh, yeah. In terms of status, I, am, I think we have like, very little changes with uh, our students so far, so as far as I know, it's just starting. Uh, might be wrong, but uh, that's it. Um, that's it. If not, if not, <clears throat> let's try again. Thank you.